Whenever we hear or read about other people, our empathy takes over. Us humans have the everlasting desire to think or even feel for others. So, whenever we see, hear or read about someone, our thoughts and feelings travel to a world of imagination. And we do it all the time, when imagining to be a superhero, a construction worker or even a guy on the street. But what if a person is somewhat out of the ordinary? Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be them? Well, we certainly have. With this podcast series, we unravel stories of the sometimes fascinating, obsessed, inspiring or outright strange folks that have wandered the edges of this earth. So, who this? Welcome to our podcast. What is the link between wrestling, 10,000 horses and Genghis Khan? Well, come with us today and find out. Welcome to everyone whose ears touches this podcast. The story I have for you today is about a Mongolian princess, Khutalan. Born in around 1260, she was a direct descendant of none other than the Mongolian conqueror himself, Genghis Khan. Her father, Kaidu Khan, had 15 children, 14 of which were boys, and so Khutalan grew up watching her brothers train, and at a very young age, she begged her father if she could train with them, to which he eventually agreed. Over the years of training, Khutalan who was so tall and strong that Marco Polo described her as well-made in all her limbs, became formidable in the Mongolian battle styles of archery and horse riding. However, where she really excelled was in wrestling. But more about that later. Khutalun became so good at fighting that not only was she allowed to train, she was allowed to go into battles alongside her father and his army. One famous battle that she participated in was against Kublai Khan, her father's brother and the grandson of Genghis Khan. Kublai was the founder of the Yuan dynasty in China and the fifth Kagan emperor of the Mongolian emperor. So this was a very, very, very powerful man. Nevertheless, Khutalan, along with her father and his army, were able to defeat Kublai in order to maintain the nomadic lifestyle of the Mongols. Marco Polo wrote of Kutalun that sometimes she would quit her father's side and make a dash at the host of the enemy and then seize one man thereout and deftly as a hawk pounces on a bird, she would carry him to her father. And this she did many, many times. I already love this story. The fact that Khutalun is one of 15 children to be the only woman. And as far as I understand, she was her father's favorite child. So already it's just so inspiring as a woman, I think, especially at a time when, (laughs) um, yeah, men would have been favored. I mean, that's something that even exists uh, in some patriarchal societies today. Mm So yeah, what a woman. Yeah, what a woman, yeah. And a woman in a time that she, a woman like her wouldn't likely to exist, you know? Yeah, uh, did they ever say how tall she was? No, I didn't see anything about her actual height. I know it must be relative uh, because, of course, people were... Yeah, we we grew, like, taller as, you know, time progressed. But I just, I was always trying to understand from the stories of, like, how... Uh, maybe this is a spoiler but like when she was wrestling like she was an absolute badass and Mm. in battle too so i'm just wondering if i'm like thinking of game of thrones (laughs) brianna of tarth's kind of situation you know yeah it's like how towering is she that's right but it would make sense listen i think you would have to do it like you would do currency like she would be worth like one million then but she's like 20 million today or something like that so our height might have been like five foot six but everybody else was like five foot four five foot three or something yeah yeah, i bet yeah you have to do a conversion rate on her height (laughs) yeah okay so now hutalun would participate in these wrestling matches called nadams 
And Marco Polo noted that she was so strong that there was no young man in the whole kingdom who could overcome her. She vanquished them all. In these nadams, Hutalun became a legend as she would defeat opponent after opponent. Kaidu, being a, t- a man of like tradition and stuff, uh, I mean, he fought a war against his brother just to maintain a certain lifestyle. Uh, he seemed a bit of a contradiction. On one hand, he wanted to follow tradition. And on the other hand, he made compromises to those traditions, especially when it came to his daughter. At her behest, Kaidu allowed Hutalun to declare for herself the terms of marriage. Hutalun decided to send a proclamation across all the empire stating that anyone who wishes to marry her would have to beat her in a wrestling match. The entrance fee to those wrestling matches were 100 horses, and given the average person of the day, they had two horses. Those who enter this match would have to be from a wealthy class of men. Well, suitor after suitor came to wrestle, but none prevailed, and everyone cheered on Kuzalun as their champion. However, once the son of King Parmar of the Malawa kingdom in India came to fight for Hutalun's hand, he wagered 1,000 horses. He was said to have been so extremely graceful and rich and good-looking that her own parents urged her to throw the match so he would become her husband. She replied, saying that she would never ever lose any match on purpose for any amount of money. This particular match drew the most spectators out of all of them. The prince lasted the longest in the ring with Hotelun, but when she finally beat him, the crowd became quiet. They stopped cheering out of disappointment. She would go on to win many, many, many matches in the end, and she amassed, get this, 10,000 horses. 10,000 horses. Incredible. Incredible. That's an army of her own. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's an army with just horses. Eh? Yeah. She could, she could make just an army of horses. Just over the enemy. Yeah. But this yeah. is incredible, though. This is people after people. So it's not like you can say, okay, it's just in the Mongolian Empire that this was happening. Like people from different countries and different kingdoms were coming to get her hand. So she was a real, real I mean, formidable. Not just out in her own right as a, a Mongol princess, but like across, across many different kingdoms. It's great. And I don't know about you guys, but I find it a bit insulting, this idea that she should throw the match because the guy is a bit good looking. Yeah. Like how preposterous yeah. is that? Yeah, yeah. She's so impressive in her own right, frankly. I mean, for me, I feel like the fact that she was testing all of these would-be suitors was like, no, she knows no one is good enough for her. Yeah. Yeah. And and I guess and I guess this is the, the the situation, right? Because she knows it, but she wants everyone else to know yes, it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like this seems like she's saying, listen, I know I'm better than you. I, I should be probably running this kingdom. Uh and I'm gonna show you why that is. I I mean of course I'm just throwing a, a thought out there. I'm not really sure what she could be thinking. Right. But what I do you think that she was hoping to some extent for someone to beat her? Like, do you think she was like cursed by her own, what's like, I, I guess, talent? Mm. Mm. I don't know. Like searching for her match? Yeah. Like who could really yeah, exactly. meet her? Yeah, I interpret yeah. it like the, I kind of, because on the one hand, I understand how the crowd thing is insulting to Cthulhuun mm. of like, I'm not going to, you know, throw this match, guys. Please shut mm. up, all mm. you, whatever, 5,000 people mm. watching this. Yeah, uh, and her parents. And her parents. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, if I was, like, a fan of Cthulhu, you know, as we ship things today, I would totally be shipping her with people. I'm just like, Cthulhu, please go for it. <laughs> you know, kind of like a fanboy sort of situation. Yeah. Mm. So I see I see the, a, a lightheartedness in it, mm. but uh. then I'm also curious about whether she was to what extent she was hoping to find someone that was good enough or mm. strong enough, I guess, because, yeah, I don't think she should have wavered and she didn't waver in her standards. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. What's interesting is there's actually another story of how she went about um, testing her suitors. And yeah. it says that 
She didn't ask her suitors to wrestle her or wager horses, but rather she had them answer three riddles and they were executed if they couldn't solve them. Executed. Executed. Wait, what? Yeah. So that's really interesting because, again, it's like her testing, yeah, the intelligence, the, I don't know, the wits of her suitors and not necessarily to end in a fairy tale marriage, mm. perhaps. I don't know. She's a very interesting character in that sense. Did she actually execute people if they weren't good enough? I mean, this is a story I that was written. Took a turd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, off in your head. Yo, you can't come with the body. You got to come with the brain. But obviously, if she's, she's like, you lose a match, you can walk away. But if you answer question wrong, I'm going to kill you. It's like she's putting intelligence like at the top of her list or, or wits at the top of her list. So there is something wrong, like something does happen if she says no in this case. Yeah. I mean, this story was written 500 years later. So mm. I guess we have to also yeah. take into account what is somebody's legend? interpretation. Yeah, exactly. Legend. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm thinking this. So a lot of the stories that we heard, of course, a lot of it is documented. Um, but I do feel like a lot of it is also she was such a larger than life character mm. that, that people are just like, yeah, she... You know, can do more, which which happens with like everyone. I feel like anyone who yeah. becomes a legend lives to to have new stories being built about them. Yeah, um, yeah, she did inspire some. Yeah, basically some myths around herself, like her sure. character. So, yeah. If you were stepping up, you two, you were stepping up to approach her for marriage. Which mm. would you prefer, a wrestling match or three riddles? I would lose anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, right. so I'm like, give me the wrestling. At least I can live. <laughs> yeah, if that doesn't involve dying, I'll go for that. Like, I'll happily make myself a fool. Mm -hmm. um, also, I'm wondering now if the riddles were like clever or if they're just like annoying riddles. Mm. You know, like those where you're just like, oh, that's the answer. Come on. Yeah. yeah. And then you just get your head chopped off. Yeah. That would suck. I think that would have annoyed me the most <laughs> if it was like a cheap riddle and I died because of it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the answer is 42. You're like, oh, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even a riddle. All right. I think, sorry, what's interesting, Joe, about what you said, like being made a fool of, I think that's at the core of it, right? That she, it's all about pride, I think, you know, yeah. if you're ending your life with 10,000 horses because of all of these men that tried to defeat you in battle in a wrestling match, mm. then pride is really what's at stake, not love. Mm. Mm. Mm, definitely. That's a, that's a good, that's, that, a, good that's a great point. Yeah. Because what happened, because she was a contender for the throne, right? Mm. Yeah. She, uh, and I think it, it didn't pan out because of essentially the male family members putting themselves in front of the situation of her progress. Mm. Do you know more about that bit? Yeah, well, I do know that she was supposed to be called up to be one of them. Um, her father had the wishes that she would take over for him. Mm. Um, however... Uh, she died kind of just like five years after her father died. Oh. And it's very, uh, I, th I think it's a very suspicious mm. situation that she died five years after her father died, knowing that her brothers were also contending for the kingdom and that the father wanted her to mm. be the one. I think she knew she had a right uh, to it and something happened there. Now, I, this is obviously speculation. There's no mm. record of this, but I can't, I can't imagine that being the case. So she died roughly at the age of 46. What would have been, do we know what the average life expectancy would have been? I do not know. Uh, a bit above 60. Like okay. 65. Oh, like, okay. So normal. she was still quite young. Yeah, yeah. She was relatively young. Yeah, so it yeah. is suspicious. It is suspicious. I mean, 14 brothers. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because she didn't die in battle, which is usually what mm. happened with, well, Warriors. Mongol royalty. Yeah. 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 Well, the situation is, though, she did eventually marry someone. Uh, but reports of who was feared, you know, some say it was a Persian writer called Rashan al-Din, who was traveling in Asia at the time. And some suggest uh, Khotan and Mara, some Mongol ruler called Ghazan, after she fell in love with him. But there are others who suggest that she married a prisoner of her father's or one of 
his aides. Mm. There's all these other rumors about who she got married to. And that's that's another thing I'm not understanding, how we don't have any record mm. of who she actually got married to. Another report suggested, though, that like she didn't actually get married. And the reason why she didn't get married was because she was having an incestuous relationship oh. with her father. Oh. Another rumor. Oh. Another rumor. I didn't see that I mean, This is a historical rumor, of course. And, uh, and then another, per- another uh, rumor is that she actually didn't like men, but mm. that, you know, given the culture she's from and the time she's in, mm. that, you know, she just was finding her way to hold off the custom mm. as long as she could. Yeah, I, I kind of like the idea of the Persian writer. That to me sounds like a romantic uh, yeah, story. <laughs> right. And the fact that she killed for intelligence, I think a writer would be yeah. someone. Yeah. It, was, yeah, it really is a, a, the, 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 the warrior and the writer, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a beautiful, I like that. So about the romantic notion of, you know, who she married and whatnot, I find that interesting because... Uh, she was, uh, you know, an inspiration for some characters, and she was the inspira- inspiration for a Turandot, which is a uh, an opera by some Italian guy mm. uh, recently. And you know, it's the same character essentially. You know, a warrior princess who fights, is undefeated in battle, etc. Um, but in this, in like the Italian version, like the more romantic Western version, it's more about a warrior princess that eventually succumbs to love. Mm. Mm. And then, but she's also an inspiration for like local myths and is a historical figure on her own. And then they always emphasize like the athletic warrior mm. pride bit. So I always found it as an interesting yeah. sort of dichotomy of, I feel like we kind of want her to find love, I think is our bias as a culture. Which yeah. comes like comes back to what I was thinking earlier, like with the fanboying and like the shipping. I was like, "Come on, Cthulhu," <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, as the words left my mouth about the Persian writer, I didn't. I don't want to endorse this. Let's focus on you know who she ends up with. Mm, oh, it's yeah. such a fairy tale. The woman should always end up with some kind of romantic figure. Mm-hmm. I'm just a romantic at heart. That's just me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you and you're not focusing on a story. I mean, that's the that's the stuff that's out there. Mm. And out of the endings, the ending I would have liked would be she became yeah, the emperor, of course. like the first emperor, woman emperor of of you know out of the the Khan line. But I don't like the idea that she got assassinated mm. and like mm. so in some bar, and nobody knows who she got married to. So I think everyone wants an ending. That satisfies, yeah. right? Someone's the ending that she she didn't get married and she held out till the death mm. because no one was good enough. And some people want, you know what? She actually was looking for love, but she realized she she wasn't finding it in her own methods, and so she had to open herself up to mm. something different. Yeah. Any which one, you know, it's just like you got to throw something out there. <laughs> people want satisfaction. And it's not just love, right? It's also companionship. I imagine Mm. that her life as the only daughter, the favorite, you know, Mm. that would have been quite a lonely existence. Mm. I mean, I'm sure she was very close to her father, but being the emperor, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're already in competition with your siblings. Exactly. Mm. You're the only daughter. You have preference. Yeah. Um, Yeah, like you have a bunch of natural enemies. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been in competition with them from you were a child. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you, you got to, to, like, train with them and go into battle with them and, and come, come out the one who is on top mm. like, constantly. Of course, there's no way you have 14 brothers in, a, in such a kingdom and people don't get jealous, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah. What do you guys think? Does anyone have anything that they think they took away from from this story yeah i think what i find interesting the most is that also how we've been talking about Gutulun, um is that she is an impressive figure is larger than life um and yet we when we try to like humanize her a bit we kind of try to bring her down to our level mm. Mm. and in doing so we kind of think up of flaws i think naturally mm. like that's what i think that's what we've been doing of like is, was she loveless you know mm. Mm. um and all the stories that surround her like all the various rumors of 
you know, incest and etc. Mm-hmm. or lesbianism back in the 1200s. Like it's such a, I don't know. I just find that interesting how we try to put her down a notch, bring her down a notch. I mean, mm. yeah, humble her by humiliating her. Yeah, a, bit. a bit. Yeah, um, even though we kind of, I I don't know if it's like you know some sort of bias we hold or because she's too larger than life. Mm. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think it's also because, at least from my side, I'm trying to kind of relate her to like modern standards mm. of a woman in that position and it just seems impossible like implausible for her not to have had serious diffi- like mountains to climb mm. yeah whatever they may be so yeah i think like you say she's just such a huge character and because of these these things happened so long ago, so many gaps, so many gray areas. Like we don't even know really who she married, if she married, um, what was the circumstances surrounding her death. Yeah, she, I, I'm going to think about her for quite yeah. some time. Yeah. And we're also assuming some sort of systemic bias. True. Mm. And now I'm curious, maybe she was really just out yeah. there like, top dog you know not facing any issues and then people genuinely didn't like her because she was like a spoiled brat but we just (laughs) don't want to look at her that way no and i don't i don't know if there's anything in the story that makes me want to look at her that way yeah i also don't want to yeah i i also don't want and i'm glad the story is what the story is um yeah i guess my my takeaway would be a very personal one a personal one so I'm from Jamaica, which is known as a, a very matriarchal culture. I've always, I never had a male boss until I went to the U.S. <laughs> like everybody, my, from my teachers to my supervisors, were all women. And of course, my mom was the biggest boss of the house. Um, and so I've always seen the image of excellence in the female body, like a woman's body. Uh, and I have a very distrust <laughs> of men. Uh, mm in terms of when they're in charge, because I, I feel like, it, especially now when, I, when I've been under so many men, it's, it's, I've had some good ones and I had some bad ones, but I've never had a bad woman leader. And to see somebody that was doing it from way back then and didn't get what she deserved, it kind of, it touches me in a way that like, you know, you know I saw that with my mom who fought the systemic situations and I don't feel like she get what she deserved but she was a very proud person who said she got what she wanted Um, and in herself that's all that matters and I think for me if Hotelun in the end didn't meet your expectation or my expectation or your expectation but in the end she got what she eventually wanted then that would be the best ending to this story um, even if <laughs> it didn't fit the grandiose, legendary ending that we would hope for such a, a great figure. I mean, I would say 800 years later, we're talking about her. I think that's she She got what she deserved in the sense that legend remembers her. And that, I think, for women, historically, that's mm. huge. Yeah. You know, um, it's the story as old as time. Women being met by the barriers all around them even though they far exceed you know their male counterparts so yeah happy to be remembering her today thank you for joining us this week on our podcast we hope we gave you enough to wrestle with catch us on any of your podcast platforms join us next week for another curious story